Hi everyone, this is our lecture for the long-awaited lecture on stage lighting. Um, this is the second of three. The first was scenic design, which I hope you listen to. The third is costume design, which will be posted shortly. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the main functions of lighting design, um, stage lighting, is visibility uh, to convey the environment, express the atmosphere or mood of the play, uh, to reveal the three-dimensional form and to establish a focus. Um, and we are going to go through each of these uh, individually. The most important function that we can, uh, that we do as lighting designers is make sure that the audience can see. Now, this is not necessarily turn up all the lights and let, let loose the lighting dogs of war. Um, this is making sure that the lighting is that the actors can be seen appropriately so uh, for example if you're doing a night scene as we see in these two pieces or in dramatic scenes um, it you can still see the actors still see what's going on but also have an element of uh, of visual narrative that is created through the stage lighting um, and this is done through direction and through um, intensity and all of the all of this other stuff which we will talk about in a second um, the actor must be seen to be heard and as we talked about before we were talking about the um, the first scene of Hamlet um, who's there nay stand and unfold yourself uh, um, Bernardo tis he uh, it is cold and I am sick at heart we know that it's night uh, they said uh, what 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 time is it oh it just said it, the the clock just struck 12 you're done with your shift so we know that it's dark. We know that the actors are scared-ish, or the characters are scared. So how do you portray this without plunging them into darkness? Now, I will guarantee you there has been some lighting designs where it is plunged in darkness or torchlight or something. But you need to focus on being able to see the face, see the facial expressions. Um, and again, like I said earlier, this is not necessarily blaring light willy-nilly. You can have darkness, you can have shadow on stage, but it has to be used judiciously. The actors must be seen to be heard. Um, as we see in this one, uh, often, you know, we have to talk about focus right there. This is the only character that you can see his face of. You better believe he's probably the one singing, or this one with the hand lit up. This is uh, Boris Gudinov. Um, where we we see enough, we we don't see everything, but we see enough to to know what's going on, to know who's singing, to get a sense of the play. Um, it's always a balancing act. Um, you you need to have sort of dimensionality in your lighting design to have narrative. Um, if you have too little light, the actors are lost. If you have too much light you sort of lose the nuance that lighting can lighting can give you. Um, so the environment, um, this is one of the other ways that lighting, um, lighting kind of tells the story that what lighting can do. Um, this provides visual cues about the time of day. The light in the morning looks way different than light in the afternoon, looks way different than the light in the evening. Light um, in February looks way different than light in July. Um, and it, it's the scientific quality of that light that the sun is closer, the earth is tilted on its axis. Um, we have a different sense of how light affects us. That's why we have such things as seasonal affective disorder. Um, weather conditions affect light. As we saw this weekend, this past weekend with the 1,000 feet of snow we got, the light had a very distinct quality. And this was all day. Had a, had a distinct quality. It was very diffuse because it was, the sunlight was filtering through clouds. It was filtering through, um, uh, filtering through some snowflakes. I've noticed, I was driving home on Friday after the show, that it was really bright out. Um, and this was because all of the existing light that was, that was in the atmosphere, mostly through um, street lights and uh, headlights and stuff like that, was being refracted, was being reflected off of all of these snowflakes. Um, and it brightened it up. It, it, it made it 
bigger and made the light more omnipresent. Um, and you'll notice today, today is Tuesday. Uh, it's way brighter out because there's less, there's less cloud cover. Um, the sun was just out a second ago and now it's going away again. So it's getting dim in my office. Um, we can even judge the location of a place by the type of light it, it portrays. The light quality in Miami is way different than the light quality in Green Bay. It's really interesting. They're both uh, cities on water, but um, the distance from Miami to the sun, the distance from Green Bay to the sun is different, and it's different enough to cause a difference in the quality of light. Um, angle and color can convey time of day, so where you hang the light and the color of gel you put in the light allows a, a conveyance of the time of day. Um, we notice that light in the morning or in the evening has a, a, a deeper tone because it's generally being refracted or it's um, uh, it's going through clouds more or it's um, it's closer to the surface so it's reflecting more. So it has a more, uh, the light quality is uh, denser. Um, during the day, whenever it's directly overhead, it's it has a less colorful quality to it. Um, projection of patterns, we also can tell where we are um, through projection of patterns using gobos to express the location. Um, this sometimes is really, really simple, like I'm doing into the woods, so all of my lights have leaf gobos in it. And those are those little metal um, pieces of metal with a pattern cut into them. Um, or, hey, I'm in a church, here's a church window, or I am in jail, here is bars, or I'm in an office, here are shutters. Um, so that's some really, really simple ways to convey a uh, location. Um, as with everything in design, uh, especially lighting and sound design, we're reminding the audience of their own experiences. So audiences generally have experiences either through their own personal experiences or through uh, other media that, hey, I, I know leafs. I know I've walked through the woods in the middle of the afternoon. I know what that looks like. Hey, I've been outside on a moonlit night. I understand it. Oh, hey, I've been in the, the height of summer on a baseball field. I understand it. So we, we know that. We're also, audiences and us, are also trained through media. So, um, so things like cities. If we've never been to New York City, we have an experience. We have a curated experience of New York City through things like CSI, through things like um, uh, movies that we watch and other media that we take in, we, we have an understanding that we then bring as an audience to, to a, a current work or to a future um, experience. Uh, another part of the forest, uh, holy crap, they're in the middle of the forest. There are branches and leaves and tree gobos. We also have things like projections. So this is a sun, uh, a sunset. Um, I think this is a ring cycle. It's a sunset. So we see either a lighting instrument back there on a backdrop or we have a, a projection of a sun setting on the backdrop. That gives us a, an understanding of what time of day it is and where we are. Um, also about what the hell is going on in the play. Um, here's another one uh, that we have a, an instance that we don't know where we are, but we get the environment. We understand it's smoky. We understand it's red. And that usually gives us good clues to maybe what's going on, especially if we're watching, this is another opera, especially if we're watching opera or something um, that is not in our language, we can gain context clues through lighting, through sound, through costuming, that maybe we don't understand exactly what's being said, but we know the story. That's how ballet works. You know, we there's generally not like Swan Lake, the lead swan doesn't come out and go, hey, yo, swan here, let's go dancing. We generally don't have that. We, we have to use the context clues to understand what's going on. This is the one, uh, Atmosphere and Mood, are, is one of the ones that is closest to the audience's heart, um, uh, literally and figuratively, um, closest to their uh, experience of the world. 
It is not explanatory, it's experiential. Um, lighting can trigger an, an emotional response from the audience. Um, I, I think I was telling some of you, we did a show uh, called Psychosis 448, and it's about a woman who is slipping in and out of, and we think it was schizophrenia, it wasn't necessarily um, uh, necessarily explained in the play because this play was pretty non-realistic, but she was definitely slipping in and out of um, states of consciousness. And there are points in the play where she is speaking to a psychologist. So in uh, those very lucid parts of the play, we turned on the work lights. We turned on the fluorescent lights. In the, we did this in the drama room in the basement. We turned on those work lights. It was very jar, jarring, but the audience knew exactly what was going on. They were jarred out of this sort of fantastical world, this fantasy world, by this sort of stark reality. We saw that in The Tempest as well. Um, for those of you who worked on or saw The Tempest, anytime... Um, Ariel or Caliban were on camp uh, on campus and anytime Ariel Caliban or Prospero were doing their things the light had a uh, a fantastical quality to it it was very uh, colorful once the court which is uh, Alonzo and Gonzalo and Sebastian and Fernand all of those came on stage I took all those colors out I made it as kind of raw and as kind of dark as possible because of the two different narratives in the story um, that triggered an emotional response. Now, this is this is a production of uh, Dust Ryan Gold. Um, and I want you to take a look at how it's the same set over and over again, but with different lighting looks and take a look at how it changes your emotional response to the place. Now, we start off with a sort of stark white lighting. This might even be they turned on the work. Um, a little more golden, a little more creamy, red, blue. So you notice that with each one of these, there's a different, the audience would engender, would, would receive a different emotional response. There's probably something different happening on stage, a different emotional context happening on stage um, as they go through these different lights. And I'm sure it wasn't like, click, we're in blue, click, we're in red, click, we're in yellow. Um, I bet you it was not as stark as that, but more gradual, a little more, um, a little more subtle than just click. But that could be an interesting, an interesting direction, if depending on the play that you're doing. Um, Lighting also reveals the form, and we did a lot of this with uh, when we did our light lab. Um, this is done using shadow, color, texture, and light. Um, so as you see, and we see this a lot in dance because we want to see the bodies. We want to see the human form moving, uh, creating shapes, creating shadows, creating um, diagonals, and telling a narrative through the physical form. Um, so this one is called freeze frame. Here's another one. I think this is at West Virginia University. But again, we can see every inch of the bodies. We don't see their faces. Their faces are less important than their bodies are in this context. Now, if they were singing, if they were saying lines, if they were uh, speaking, uh, we would probably have a little more light on their faces. But as of as it is, we just kind of don't. Um, we need to see their we need to see their their body. Um, here's another one. Uh, kind of reveals the figure, um, um, so that this character is very very important. So we're gonna see all of it. Everybody else kind of fades into the background except for her. She is. I, I think this is a um, Di Valkyrie actually. Di Valkyrie. Uh, I think that might be Broomhilda. So she's very important. So she's gonna have. She's going to be revealed more fully than the other characters on, on stage. And again, a little bit more. And this is using um, direction to sort of really tell where light is coming from. And, and speaking of that, um, lighting also creates a focus. It tells the audience where to look. If somebody is singing a solo, if you're at the end of the musical Gypsy, and you get in, uh, you're getting the mama song. Mama said be good. Mama said be do be do be do be do. 
um, you better have a spotlight on mama. You better have, or if, if you're doing, um, if you're doing Fiddler on the Roof and Tevia singing, if I were a rich man, you better have a spotlight on that dude. You better isolate him. Now that seems a little old fashioned, but it's, um, you are always as a lighting designer, well, as any sort of designer, you're ex um, you're balancing the audience's expectations versus newness versus surprise versus your own interpretation of it. You have to keep the audience in mind. Now, it depends always on how much influence the audience has in what you're doing. But um, if you don't keep that in mind, you're going to lose them. If the audience is feeling like they are being left out of the game, um, you're going to lose them and they're not going to want to come back. Um, so we see this is um, this is Odin standing here in the middle. You can tell white suit right in the middle, lights right on top of him. He is the most important person on that stage. Um, here's another one uh, called Roses on the Rocks. We're told where to look by the highest, the the brightest element. Um, and generally, intensity <coughs> tells the audience where to look. That um, certain light is brighter than anything else around it. Um, also, color can do that. So we see that in this one, that it's not only intensity and direction, but it's also color that tells the audience where to look. They can't look anything but where the audience, uh, where the lighting is telling them to look. Um, so there's six controllable properties of light to make these things happen. Uh, it's direction, intensity, shape, color, quality, and movement. Um, so direction, direction is the angle of light hitting an object or performer on the stage. Now, these are all sort of uh, important to know because they have uh, not only they have their own sort of uh, semiotical information in it, but they also tell part of that emotional landscape of a play. Um, direction can also give us clues about the time of, day, time of day and directional orientation. So you can see in this picture over here, it is definitely later in the afternoon because of the golden tint and the direction coming in lower on the day. Can't really tell what time of day this is because it's really diffuse. Um, probably not midday. It's probably, again, closer to the uh, evening um, because the light is a little bluer and you don't have any direct light on any of these buildings. Um, so revelation of the form, a directionality can give you revelation of the form. So down, using downlight, backlight, diagonal backlight, high side light, mid side, low side, high front, straight front, low front, diagonal front. And we're going to go through these. Um, so downlight or top light, it's light that is coming directly down on the top of the performer. We see that in the dancers. We see, so there's, this is smoke or haze or fog, um, which uh, haze diffusion um, each beam of light is hitting a particulate in the fog and it makes the fog glow, kind of like what I was talking about in the snow. Um, and it's really interesting because then you see the beams of light as well as the character. So this is top light. Um, you can see how important that is in this dance because the arms and the hair is what shows up first before they start dancing around. This is a Macbeth, the appearance, appearance of uh, Doctor and Lady Macbeth. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, um, but this is the downlight that kind of coasts over the top of their shoulders. You can see crowns, you can see hair. Um, it's a very dramatic lighting. A lot of these light, these types of lights are very dramatic. Um, other than these earlier ones are very, very dramatic. Anything that is not kind of like high front or side light is usually like super dramatic um, and very narratively laden. Uh, backlight. So this is backlight kind of really high uh, at a high 45 degree angle. Um, the neat thing about this is that it throws really long shadows behind you because you block out part of light. Again, this light is very, very, very diffuse. It has some particulates in the air. So it's um, usually done with a hazer or a fogger. Um, so this is our backlight. We, we see the form, but we don't necessarily see the face. I think this is a chorus line. Um, and there's a part of the chorus line where they're backlit for a big, I think it's this one singular sensation, the very last song. Um, so this is backlight that is kind of hip height. Um, high side light. So this is a, the latest M butterfly, I think. Um, and you'll notice that it comes in high from the side and sort of sculpts, puts, 
puts people in highlight and shadow uh, a lot in this, uh, reveals and conceals. This is a Swan Lake, again, with the high sides. I love it when they use hazers because then we can see exactly where it's coming from. Again, we're trying to carve out the, the form. You would not be able to see these legs if we didn't have side light like this. So you wouldn't be able to see these arms if we didn't have these high side lights. Now, this Swan Lake is a little more... Um, a little more shishi, a little more fancy than uh, what you generally see in Swan Lakes, um, maybe a little more daring. Um, as we might know that uh, a lot of ballet is very, very, very traditional. They don't like messing with tradition in a lot of ballets, but I love it when they do. This almost looks like a George Seepin, um set behind it, this enormous wire work. I have to go back and take a look and see whose it is. Um, side light, again, we see this in a lot of dance. Um, there is, or if you're describing sunsets or sunrises, you'll see a lot of side light. Notice that we don't see a lot of her face, but we see all of that foot. Um, and this is a, uh, I think this is a ring side, and it's Broomhilda and that's Siegfried there, but it's a direct side light coming in. And look at these long, beautiful shadows. Um, that's how we know time of day, other than if we can't see the sun, um, we know by the length of shadows. Um, and that's something that is is encoded in our lizard brains. Uh, front light, that's light that's kind of straight, either straight on towards your face, as we see here. I think this is Marilyn Monroe here. It's pointing right at her face. Um, or this sort of high front light, as we see here, kind of coming down and highlighting her very lovely there. Um, again, front light next to normal. These are 45 degrees, uh, 45 degree angle. That's how the light is. And you'll notice that what it does is it gives depth to the face. This sort of 45 degree angle is really, really good because it allows light under our shadow under the nose, shadow under the chin, shadow behind the head where the hair is so that the people look three dimensional. And this is a dancing at Luna South, which uses all of that sort of 45 front light. This is very traditional lighting here. Um, we also have lighting that is kind of on the directional. This is a, a, a some sort of ballet, but you'll notice that everything is perfectly evenly lit, that there's no specials, there's no highlights. It is omnidirectional, which means it comes from everywhere and it lights everything pretty evenly. Now, this is kind of unusual a lot for ballet, but sometimes you'll see stuff like this, especially with big crowd scenes or big dance scenes where there's a whole bunch of things going on. I find this kind of interesting. It's sort of how, um, I'm not going to say boring, but how boring it is, <laughs> out of sort of normal this lighting is for something is something like ballet. Um, intensity, this is the brightness of the visual composition. Um, that's the amount of light that jet actually leaves the instrument. So you hang five instruments in the air and you turn them all, all at 100%. You turn them all at 50%. That's the intensity. Um, you turn some of them on at 100, some of them on at 50. And that creates shadows, that creates visual interest. interest. Um, this intensity can also be changed from the distance from the light to the stage. So if you have uh, think of think of it this way. If you have a flashlight and you have the flashlight right next to your face, it's going to be super bright as if uh, the difference between somebody 10 feet away with a flashlight shining in your face is going to be dimmer because the light diffuses. Um, it also can, intensity also can be um, ch uh, changed by the reflectivity of the objects on stage. So if you have water, if you have metal, if you have Gold, as we see here, this is um, this is a ring cycle here, and they have this huge golden mask that reflects, and you can kind of see the reflection in the bottom here, in the bottom of the uh, underneath is like, we usually don't light underneath here, um, like underneath the breasts or underneath the arms because there's not light there. Um, but if you put something shiny, if you have a shiny floor, if you put something shiny down that reflects that up, you're going to have light in weird places. Um, again, the intensity of light, very low intensity versus very high intensity. Um, for those of you who took my sign and symbol class and I showed you the uh, ring cycle with uh, the Flight of the Valkyries, this is the set from this, the Roy Royal Danish Offers version that we watched. Um, 
using kind of like a low front light, uh, a difference of intensity. So these characters here and their behinds are very intense, very intense, low intensity, low intensity. So you, it doesn't have to have all the same intensities across the whole stage picture. You can have some darker, some brighter. Um, again, creating visual interest and creating a visual narrative. So different ways to uh, control density, uh, intensity, is dimmer controlled, just telling the board, hey, can you have this light at 100, can you have this light at 50, can you have this light at 10. You can put different wattages of light or different lamp pipes in. So if you have a, uh, a 375, 375 watt bulb versus a 575 watt bulb, it's going to be brighter um, at 100, but each of those are going to be brighter at 100%. Using a filter changes the intensity. If you part, put in a R98, which is that sort of gray, light gray or a dark gray, or an R99, which is the chocolate, that is a filter which will change the intensity. Um, if you put in a dark blue gel, you're not going to get as much intense light out because the, the gel is keeping more light going through it than if you had an RO2, a light amber. Um, a, a R68 is going to be dimmer than an RO2, um, which is the amber and the blue. Um, and vary the distance of the light from, from the object. So if you have a light on it 100%, put one person right in front of it, put one person 20 feet away from it, the person right in front of it is going to be brighter. Uh, we can change the shape of the light. We can't see light until it hits something, even if... Um, uh, even with uh, using diffuseness. Um, and there are different ways to alter or make uh, light visible, uh, or make the shape of the light visible. Um, we use shutters. We can shape the light through shutters uh, or gobos, which is uh, a, a great way to make texture. Um, or atmospheric haze or smoke that we, like we've been talking about. So we see here, this is another... Uh, another ring cycle. I did a big project in graduate school where I researched all of the ring cycles that have been done since 1978. Yeah, I like big research projects. So I just have all these pictures. So I just use them over and over again because they're super great. Um, so this is changing the shape of the light because of the hammered reflective um, scenery makes that light a certain shape. Um, using gobos, as we can see here, just kind of this is a, a very specific gobo um, or tree gobo number four. Um, these are some more breakup sort of gobos. There's, a, so there's two different types of gobos. There's an object gobo. So this is a leaf. This is a prison bars. This is a shutters. This is a, a rose window. Or you can have things like breakups. And we see breakups in both of these. Breakups are sort of uh, like on the floor here are sort of nondescript shapes that have an emotional context. And they can be sharp and pointy and jagged, or they could be circles, they could be scratches. Um, and you don't necessarily use those for narrative purposes, but more emotional uh, emotional conveyance purposes. Um, I think this is actually a glass menagerie. So we have these sort of straight lines and then a breakup on the floor. Um, and this is showing the diffuseness. So this is a hazer. This is a lot of hazer, a little bit of a hazer here. Um, a hazer puts, part, like I said before, puts particulates in the air, and we see the light. I think this is a King Lear. We see light. Uh, we see the particulates of light um, are thrown through. A uh, frost does the same way. Now this is a uh, a type of gel that is diffuse in it, and uh, as the light comes out of the instrument, it hits all the sort of texture on the gel itself and it breaks up the breaks up the beam of light so you don't get this nice clean crisp beam, beam of light it comes out of the instrument already sort of hazy um, color transmitted through gel usually gel uh, lamp type again an led looks different than a conventional incandescent light i'm sure you guys have noticed that as you go through different classrooms on campus some still have conventional um, conventional incandescent light versus LED lighting. Um, if you go into the scene shop and you turn on the lights 
at, there's a set of a bank of lights at the paint area versus the lights in the room itself. They're two different color temperatures um, because it's it, about mixing paint and color temperature. Um, lamp type, uh, dimming the instrument. We have that thing called amber shift. As a light gets, the intensity of a light gets lower, um, you start to see the, the golden glow of the coils in the, uh, in the, the lamp. Um, and so you get this, uh, this color, the lighting instruments, the, the lamps, the bulbs color, uh, and rel relativity can uh, show color as well. And so you could tell narrative through color. So um, this is, this is a Robert Wilson production of, I can't remember what it is, um, but you notice the dude loves Loves colored lighting on backdrops. So again, we're going to look at a bunch of different colors here, and each one tells a different story. And then kind of gray. Here's another one. This is all the same production. There's another one. So each one of these is just using colored lights and probably just uh, strip lights. Probably a strip of lights down here, a strip of lights up here with different colored gel in it. He is very old school. This is probably an older production too before LEDs became really popular. Um, quality of the light. This means diffuseness, hardness, softness, or sharpness. Um, filters, like I talked about, different types of gel that you slide in, a frost or a silk that changes the quality of the light. Um, adjusting the fixture focus, we, we do that a lot in um, in light hang and focus where you just turn the little knob at the top and slide it in and out. Um, and using atmospherics helps to change the quality of the light as well. Each one of these different qualities of lights have a narrative, um, have a narrative, narrativity to them. I think that's a word. So a sharp, harsh light tells a different story than a soft light. A soft diffuse light. So this is some harsh light, harsh light, soft light. Um, movement, uh, you also, uh, another controllable poly, uh, quality of light is its uh, movement, um, kind of basic follow spotness. You turn on a light, you point it at an actor and you follow that actor around. Um, moving lights as well, uh, which we see a lot of, and you can, I posted this up to our Moodle page. So if you want to watch, uh, watch that link yourselves, it's just, um, that somebody, uh, program moving lights to play along with music. You'll see that a lot. Um, and cueing, cueing is another way that we show movement of lights that we turn on one light, we turn off another light in conjunction with each other that shows movement. Uh, process. Process of lighting design, you read the script, talk to the director design team. Uh, research, you want to research the play in its world, uh, emotive research, and some of the technical research. How many lights do they have? How much budget do you have? Do you have to rent in moving lights if you don't own enough? Do you have to buy gel? Do you have to, um, do you have to hire somebody to help you hang? Um, what's the space like? Another bit of research is what is the space like? What special effects do you want to use? Do you need to use? Um, you create magic sheets. Now that's the cheat sheet for each area, what the light looks like. Um, do your channel hook up, your light plot, uh, you watch a rehearsal, which is very important as a lighting designer. Because often lighting designers are not, um, are not, tied to a theater all the time. They move around. A lot of the lighting designers I know will light 30 productions a year or more. Um, if they have really good assistance, they'll do more. Um, so you're not, you seeing rehearsals are really, really important because you're, you don't have that luxury of like popping into rehearsal and making sure your decisions are right. You, you have the opportunity to come out maybe once or twice during rehearsal process to see and make your decisions from there. <laughs> light hang, put the light in the air. A focus call, point the lights where you want them. Um, writing cues, the level sets and writing cues. That take, sometimes takes a pretty long time, depending on how complicated your show is. Uh, technical rehearsals, that's just sitting and looking at lights. Uh, opening night, doing maintenance on the light plot. Often if you're using gel that has a lot of pigment in it, the gel will burn out, making sure your lights don't burn out. 
um, making sure everything is focused in the same place that you did before. Um, this doesn't happen a lot here because the lights are so far away, but I've worked in theaters where we're moving scenery around lights and every once in a while we're, we'll do what is called a carpenter focus, which is I wagged a light and now it's out of place. So that's one thing that a, an assistant lighting designer, a master electrician will do or a production electrician will do is check all that to make sure everything is Everything on week three is the same as day one. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, and then strike putting everything back the way it, where it was. Um, let's talk a little bit about the different lighting instruments. And we did this a little in class, uh, I think. Um, so the ellipsoidal reflector spotlight, this is one of the most popular. Um, the Fresnel, we're gonna go through all of these. Uh, Fresnel, PAR, follow spots, psych lights, and floodlights, scoop in the floodlight. Um, the ERS, the elliptical reflector spotlight, this is a source four particular one. Um, source four has become the most popular of the ellipsoidal reflector spotlights just because it is highly efficient um, and it is a workhorse. Um, the reason it's called, if you remember, the reason it's called a source four is that if you look at the lamp, the bulb, there are four different coils in it. Um, so the light is nice and even and it's omnidirectional. It's not coming from one or two, that it has a fullness to the light. Um, the beam is adjustable um, and uh, the shaping, it's a, you can change the shape of the bulb, the distance of the bulb, the angle of the bulb, which we're going to, or the angle, angle of the beam, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, high intensity, it puts out a lot of light um, and it has variable light quality. Um, this is one of the few conventional instruments that is capable of creating texture or pattern um, through the use of um, through the use of gobos. This is the uh, the ERS is the only one that is set up for gobo use. Um, now we have moving lights that can do it, but um, there's a difference. So a conventional is all of these lights that we're going to talk about are what are considered conventional. Um, these are lights that are incandescent. That's a type of bulb and um, and use, don't use any mechanics um, versus LED lights, um, which are becoming more and more popular. We don't use them a lot at our, our theater. We have them in the basement, we, but we don't use them a lot um, in our productions and moving lights. Um, this is the most common and one of the most versatile. You can get a lot, a lot, a lot of bang for this very little buck. So let's take a look at some of the mechanics of this. So this is the ellipsis. Uh, the ellipsoidal, so this is the reflector, it's the ellipse, elliptical reflector, elliptical reflector spotlight. So the reflector here is an ellipse, so, and you'll see. So this is the light source here, the the bulb, the lamp. And you'll see how it hits the reflector, causes a very clean focus point. Now this is what is where this focus is is called the gate, which is right here. So as you see here in this very conventional looking one, comes out, focuses on the gate. This is where your shutters are, and this is where you put the gobos. And then it comes back out, and it hits a plano convex lens system. So plano is the flat, convex is the curve. And you'll notice that they're two back to back. What that does is that it, it creates another very clean, very circular focal point whenever it comes out of the instrument and hits hits the surface, it's a very nice, clean circle. Um, so these are the different parts that's taken apart as source four. Um, there's, missing a piece back here, which is, oh, that's here, right here. Um, so this is the, um, where the, the lamp is stored, the lamp here. This is the reflector here. This is the yoke, retainer bolt, keeps all this stuff together, shutters, Gobo slot, drop an iris slot. So if you want to have a little bit of an iris in there, this is the shutter barrel lens tube. This is where the Plano convex lens is. And then this is the color frame holder. And this is what it looks like all together. Um, we talk a little bit about the degree angle, um, the beam angle of a light. And I'll say whenever we're hanging lights, we'll say, hey, go get a 26 degree, go get a 36 degree. What that is, is the distance from the light to the floor and how wide that beam is. So if you have a 36 degree, 
if it is 40, I think it's 45 feet away from the floor, um, how big of a, how big of an angle is that beam that you, that is hitting the floor? So you'll see um, the biggest is the 50. That means that this angle here is enormous. And then the 36 degree is a little smaller. 26 degree is smaller. And then 19 degree is really small. This is called photometrics. Um, I don't know a lot about photometrics. I'm learning more as I go, but um, it is not something I studied at all. I'm a set designer, really. Um, so as I'm learning, I'm passing it on to you. Uh, okay, going back old school. So that is totally newish school. The ERS is one of the most popular. For now, you might have seen a lot of in your in your youth. I certainly use a lot of them in my youth. Um, the light from a Fresnel is soft. It's not, you can't sharpen it at all. You can't make the light harsher. Um, it is a even spread. Um, the beams blend really well with each other. Um, it's really ideal for very short throws. So if, um, if you're working in a conventional space like, um, uh, uh, like the Walter, this would, oh, back in the day, you would have a lot of these. We actually own some of these left. We never use them, but we have them. And I don't let anybody throw them away because I like keeping them. Um, variable beam spread capability, changing the lens and moving the lens train back and forth, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and to shape the beam, you can use barn doors. It can also be uh, gelled fairly easily. As you see here, there's a gel spot. Um, Fresnel comes from this sort of lens that was developed in France to for, um, um, what, are they, what are these called? Oh, lighthouses. So this is a Fresnel lamp in a lighthouse. And you'll notice the reason that it's stepped is because they couldn't make this enormous piece of glass lens so they had to do it in little bitty pieces. And each one of these little pieces orders light and makes it stronger, as we'll see here in a second. So this is a Fresnel lens. This is the front, and this is what it looks like at the side. Um, and so this is the, um, you can change the, the lens here so that it has a reflector. Um, and this is all in that case that we saw. And you move it back or forward closer or further away from the lens and changes the quality of the beam that comes out. And we can see that here, how it sort of comes out all over the place. And then the Fresnel lens sort of straightens it up. And this is what it looks like coming out. Um, they have moved from sort of conventional. It's not very efficient. Um, you can't do a lot of things with it. Um, it's very nice. It's a pleasant light, but it's not very efficient and, um, so they're moving, this sort of light has been moved either into uh, using a PAR, which we'll talk about in a second, or buying a, um, an LED for now. Um, those have become more and more popular. The next type is the PAR, come back. Excuse me, is um, this light cannot be shaped. It's a cannon. This is basically a cannon. And PAR stands for Parabolic Ref Illuminized Reflector. Um, you see ellipsoidal reflector spotlight, uh, par is parabol a parabolized, uh, illuminized, a parabolic illuminized reflector. So it's, uh, both lights are describing the type of reflector that is used. Now, if you remember, go back to it. So this is our ellipsoidal, it's kind of a fat C. Um, in a, a par, it is flatter. Um, it's a para, para, Parabolized, paralyzed, um, and it, it's illuminized. So it comes out really straight, just a cannon. Sharp, intense light. It's really harsh in quality. Um, the projected rays are really close to kind of what the sun is, and we'll take a look at that in a second. This is really good for rock and roll concerts. If you've gone to a concert, if you've gone to an old school concert, um, this is what you're looking at. It's just big lights that fill a space. Um, great for color washing. Um, you have to change the lamp to change the beam. So this is kind of, like, if this looks familiar, it kind of looks like what you might see outside um, in your spotlights or your uh, emergency lights outside. So it's it, the, the lamp and the lens, the bulb, the filament and the lens are all in one. So to change how the light comes out, um, which is narrow, very narrow, uh, medium, wide or very wide flood, uh, narrow spot or wide flood, 
what you do is you change out the entire lamp casing like this. So each one of these ridges changes the type of light that comes out of the instrument. Um, this is what the light looks like whenever it, it is uh, projected onto a surface. It's sort of um, sort of egg shaped and it's hot in the middle and nice and soft on the end. And this is what they look like shining. Um, the next one is a source four. So again, that four filaments, this is an e, uh, ETC electronic technology company, um, which is, who also make the source four ellipsoidal. Um, and this is again, the soft, even light. These are workhorses. Um, rather than changing out the whole lens and uh, lamp, uh, unit, you change out the different lens. So this is, um, this is wide, uh, very wide, wide, narrow, very narrow spots. Um, you can use gels with these and barn doors to kind of control this light. But if you go into the Walter and look up, this is what you see the most of because it's good fill light. Follow spot. We all know the follow spot. How many, how many of you have worked a follow spot? Uh, point in at actor, turn on. Um, you can focus it, you can change. Remember this knob and the different colors up here. Size of beam, there's usually a knob back here that changes, that moves the lamp back and forth from the size of beam. Or um, if I remember correctly, it's been ages, there's a an iris back here, a knob that you turn left or right, and irises. This moves the, the reflector back and forth from the lamp. Um, this changes the colors, and this is the dampener. Very useful for providing focus, not much else. Um, so psych lights, uh, if you're lighting a big psych, uh, which is a big piece of fabric upstage, you can put different colors gel, different color gel in these. Um, lighting a psych is really elegant. Um, it's kind of fun as well. You got a lot going on it. So far psychs, scoops are just these big buckets of light and strip lights. So these are far psychs, Psych lights, far sykes, which is this one, strip lights and scoops. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. Uh, tune in for costumes next.